everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Cleopatra and the Siege of Alexandria by Historia Civilis. So, this is presumably a continuation of the Roman Civil War. As many of you guys have commented, uh, even after the death of Pompey, the Civil War has not ended. Uh, I, you know, made a false assumption that after Pompey had died, the Civil War would sort of come to an end. But it appears that we actually have a bit to go. So I think we're going to see more of that in this video. If you guys end up enjoying this one, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's get into this reaction. Back to Egypt. In the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Pharsalus, Caesar did not linger in Greece. Mm. Pharsalus, remember, was Julius Caesar's decisive victory over Pompey Magnus, which effectively, although not literally, ended the Roman Civil War. Okay, so at this sort of phrasing, by the way, I'll say this is why I thought that the Civil War had come to an end. Um, but it seems like it hadn't literally come to an end. It's just that once Pompey was gone, sort of the writing was on the wall. Like it was coming to an end but it hadn't literally come to an end yet. Caesar immediately sent one of his top lieutenants, or lieutenants, Mark Antony back to Rome to oversee the political situation. And then, after some intelligence gathering, he set off to Egypt in pursuit of Pompey, taking with him only 4,000 soldiers for the sake of speed. Mm. As we know, Pompey was killed the moment he stepped foot in Egypt, but this fact was not yet known to the outside world. Oh, interesting. So I, I think we're going to get Caesar's reaction, and, you know, like I said when this happened, I'm pretty sure that when Caesar found out Pompey had been assassinated, he wasn't pleased, but I'm sure his story Civilis is going to now show us. When Caesar arrived in Egypt, officials greeted him as an honored guest, and as a token of Egypt's goodwill, presented him with Pompey's severed head. Ooh, According brutal. to some ancient sources, Caesar reacted to this by recoiling in horror and refusing mm. to look at it. When the Egyptians handed him Pompey's signet ring, these same sources say that Caesar broke down in tears. Wow. Jeez. I mean, so, yeah, he reacted negatively. I uh, didn't think you would be so sad about it, considering you just fought a civil war against the guy. Um, I suppose they were once allies, but they had drifted apart. Um, so yeah, interesting. And, of course, we have to think, you know, this is coming from a selection of sources, and we also have to wonder about the biases of those sources and the accuracy. Historians are not quite sure what to make of this incident. Was Caesar upset, or was he pretending to be upset? <clears throat> Or was this a piece of propaganda intended to win over Pompey's supporters? We don't mm. know. You know what? That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that before, um, mainly because I only vaguely remembered what happened. I mean, it could be that Caesar was legitimately upset. You know, he hadn't wanted it to end like this. You know, perhaps he wanted to capture Pompey alive and, you know, have that on his resume. He didn't necessarily have to murder him. It might look better for Caesar. Um, but, so he could have been legitimately upset for those reasons. It could have also been, you know, he could have been pretending or a piece of propaganda, you know, him trying to show his uh, magnanimity, his mercy. Uh, we've seen him try to show that in the past, you know, and say his conquest in Gaul, Caesar was a pretty brutal fellow, but during the Civil War, he tried to be a little more merciful because he was fighting against fellow Romans. So this could be another attempt to show... You know, I take no pleasure in fighting this civil war. I take no pleasure in Pompey being killed. I didn't want it to end this way. Um, it definitely could be that, though I, I suppose we can't really know. Even the ancient sources disagree. Plutarch calls Caesar's grief genuine, while Cassius Dio describes Caesar, quote, feigning to mourn. Regardless, I think we can say with some confidence that Pompey's head was not what Caesar wanted. What yeah. he wanted was Pompey's surrender. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely the case. Whether it was for more genuine reasons or propaganda reasons, uh, I think we can definitely say that Caesar wanted his surrender over his life because, you know, him surrendering, it would just be a lot easier to reconcile 
um, the rest of Rome to bring the civil war to an end. It's a sort of a smoother way to end things rather than him being murdered and potentially becoming a martyr or inspiring others to fight on. That could be a problem. By this point, it was clear that Caesar genuinely wanted to reintegrate every Pompeian that was willing to acknowledge his supremacy, knowing that their cooperation was key to a lasting peace. Yeah, well, as we've seen from the beginning of the Civil War, and to Caesar's credit, um, I mean, he genuinely wants to govern Rome. You know, it's not, I mean, you can lay forth his motivations for doing what he did, but he wants to govern a united Rome. He wants to end the civil war. Uh, and regardless of what you think of his style of leadership, he does want to reconcile everybody. He wants to bring the Pompeians back into the fold. I mean, we've seen that from the beginning. Reintegrating Pompey would have been the ultimate prize, but now, thanks to the Egyptians, that was off the table. Whether or not Caesar was genuinely upset, he used Pompey's murder as an excuse to bring his 4,000 soldiers off the ships and into the city of Alexandria. Ooh. The Egyptians did not give him permission to do this, but they didn't feel comfortable stopping him either. The Romans paraded through the streets of Egypt's largest city as if they were a conquering army. This understandably offended the Alexandrians, and hmm. before too long, there were protests and then rioting. And I mean, Alexandria has for a long time been a very important city in this region, and it will continue to be a very important city in this region for hundreds of years to come. Uh, and as important cities do, particularly at this time, um, you know, they're willing to speak their mind. The residents know they have a, a pretty high level of influence, and so there will be protests, riots, etc., etc. We see this a lot down the line in Constantinople. Of course, we see it in Rome at this time, and Alexandria is one of those really important regional powerhouses. Um, although, you know, I'm really not sure what sort of the status of Egypt is at this point. Clearly, it still has some level of power, but, you know, obviously Rome is the dominant power of the region, and I think Egypt has, I believe at this point they've sort of passed their golden era, but I'm really not familiar with Egyptian history, so I couldn't tell you, you know, at what point uh, in their development they're at. And then several Roman soldiers were killed. Uh -oh. For the Romans, it was no longer safe to be out on the streets. Caesar took his tiny army and hid them away in the city's royal quarter, which housed the Egyptian king, his court, and a bunch of government buildings. Mm. Caesar had entered Alexandria, intending to get Pompey's surrender, but instead, in a matter of days, he had accidentally engulfed the city in a general riot, and, uh -oh. just to make things extra complicated, taken custody of the Egyptian king. Oh. What a mess. Yeah, I, you know what, I didn't even think of that, but yeah, if you're taking on residence in the royal quarters, um, whether you intend to or not, and I'm not sure if Caesar did this on purpose, he probably did, but now the residents are like, okay, not only have you stormed our city, you're now basically holding our court, our royal court captive <laughs> at sword point. That's not good. Before we go any further, we should talk about the Egyptian royal family. Ah. The current Egyptian king was a 13-year-old boy named Ptolemy. Ptolemy mm. had two older sisters, Cleopatra and Arsinoe, and one younger brother also named Ptolemy. Spoiler alert, they're all named Ptolemy and... Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, Ptolemy's a familiar name in Egyptian history because there's a lot of them, which is a little confusing, but... I mean, you know, a lot of countries do this, naming the royals the same thing over and over again. Uh, of course, Cleopatra is an even more familiar name, I'm sure, to everybody. It's super annoying. The current King Ptolemy's father, also named Ptolemy, had died three years earlier. And to sum up his entire life in one sentence, which is a totally fair thing to do, the only thing that kept him on the throne was support from Rome, specifically mm. a series of massive loans. When the current king's father got sick, he named Rome as the executor of his will, which was basically oh, yeah. a way of sucking up. I think we talked about this before. So, judging from that, it sort of seems like Egypt is still sort of technically an independent power, but they, you know, are on some level sort of under the thumb of Rome. Like, they're, they're technically an independent power in the region, 
but they don't have too much actual autonomy. You know, stray too far, and they might get in trouble with the real powerhouse of the region, the Romans. To his benefactors. When he died, his son inherited his father's crown and debts. Now that Caesar occupied the royal quarter, he was like, while I'm here, how is that debt repayment coming? Caesar owed pensions to tens of thousands of soldiers, and at this moment he was basically broke. It would be awfully nice if Egypt could magically solve this problem. When Very cocky Caesar thing to do. Yeah, so I know we just engulfed your city in protests and riots, and I'm basically holding the royal court captive, but uh, you want to pay me back in those debts? I mean, it's a very cocky thing to do, but also, you know, I guess this is the right time. I mean, you're in position, right? <laughs> you're you're there. You know, you've got all your men. You're saying, how about you pay those debts back now, huh? Or, I don't know, something could go wrong. Caesar approached the king's counselors. They kind of gave him the runaround, saying that it would take some time, blah, blah, blah. They would mm. try sending installments to Italy whenever they could. Caesar told them not to bother, because he would be remaining in Egypt until their debts were paid. Ooh. As you can imagine, this was a tense exchange. Yeah, that's awkward. Because, I mean, and this is what's been happening so far, but with things like this, you can usually talk your way around it, you know, negotiate. Yeah, we'll pay back eventually. Um, but Caesar's doing the rare thing that we don't usually see with international debts, and that applies today as well is that he's putting his foot down. I mean, if you look at our modern world today, we're extremely globalized, and there are a lot of international debts between countries. Now, no one has really put their foot down yet and demanded them back. Um, I mean, because it would probably cause the collapse of the global economy. Um, but on a much smaller scale, that's what Caesar's doing now. He's saying, yeah, okay, no more of that. I actually want the debts repaid. And the Egyptians are going, oh, really? Now? <laughs> okay, well, uh, I guess we'll try and work something out. Meanwhile, the people of Alexandria continued to riot against the Roman presence in their city. Caesar accused the king and his counselors of being behind the riots, but they denied Ooh. it. Second spoiler alert, they were definitely behind the riots. Of course. Since the Egyptians were giving Caesar a hard time, he decided that now was a good opportunity to step up and act as executor of the dead king's will. Mm. So what was in that will? For starters, the child King Ptolemy was supposed to serve as co-monarch with his older sister, Cleopatra. Currently, uh. that wasn't happening. In fact, Cleopatra had been ousted by a rival faction and was now raising an army to the south. Not only were the terms of the king's will not being met, but an Egyptian civil war seemed imminent. Really? Since the okay. king's will... Political instability, interesting situation, but, you know, could be very advantageous if you're, um... I don't know if I'd call him a foreign conqueror, but he kind of is, Caesar. Um, I mean, he hasn't necessarily come there to conquer, but he's come there to assert his power, assert his will. Um, so he is kind of acting in that role. A situation like that, a brewing civil war, he could definitely take advantage of that. Well, was at the root of this problem. The Romans had every right to intervene if they wished. Caesar announced that he would be doing just that. He would mediate the dispute. Naturally, the king and his counselors hated every second of this. It's kind of, uh, it's an interesting situation because these last couple of episodes we've been watching the Civil War, the Roman Civil War, Caesar fighting Pompey, Romans against Romans, and now it's like we're, we're getting a brief aside, you know, Caesar's trip to Egypt, uh, and, you know, we've got a whole different context, new players, a uh, different situation. It's like we've briefly removed Caesar from the context of the Roman Civil War and gone to a totally different thing. Though, of course, you know, everything's all connected. We are still in that broader context. It's just sort of a different, immediate situation. Caesar's implied message was clear. If Ptolemy's faction wouldn't cooperate, maybe another faction would. Mm. Before we go any further, we should probably talk about Ptolemy's older sister, Cleopatra, because even if this is all brand new to you, you probably recognize that name. Of course. Every credible ancient source describes her as charming and witty and incredibly intelligent. Apparently, she could speak at least nine languages. 
I mean, she's going to be an important player for a while to come, largely off the back of her personal charm, charisma, persuasion abilities. Uh, they're going to take her far. And like I said, she's going to be important, um, you know, for a bit in Roman history. Including Hebrew and Latin. She was even the first person of her dynasty that could actually speak Egyptian, which was an wow. incredibly tough language for an outsider to learn. She was a world-class strategic thinker. She was often the first to diagnose problems, and when she knew what needed to be done, she was absolutely tenacious. The fact that she also happened to be royalty truly made her a force to be reckoned with. Mm. So Cleopatra was attempting to build an army in the south of Egypt, but this wasn't going very well. Then, out of nowhere, a wild card entered the picture and offered to mediate. This could be turned to her advantage, but she needed a plan. Well, to be fair, it seems like any other option would be better than what she's doing right now, which is failing to raise an army throughout the south of Egypt. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that was going that way, but, I mean, sort of the base of Egyptian power is, you know, in the north, around Alexandria at this point. Um, and so, if there's another option, she's definitely better off taking it. And then, bam, she had a plan. Cleopatra found herself a tiny boat, disguised herself in rags, and set off on an exhausting eight-day journey down the Nile. Her only companion on this expedition was a dude named Apollodorus, who was mm. a big guy from Sicily who presumably spoke Latin without an accent. When Cleopatra and Apollodorus... I will say just the... This is kind of ridiculous and off topic, but <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, a big Sicilian guy. I'm just thinking of like a modern big Sicilian guy. So I'm like, hey, we got you, Cleopatra. Just some... <laughs> Some big New York Italian guy accompanying Cleopatra as, you know, as her bodyguard. <laughs> ...reached the end of the Nile. They waited until dark and then silently rowed their boat into Alexandria's royal harbor. At the docks, Cleopatra stuffed herself into a laundry bag and Apollodorus hiked the bag wow. over his shoulder and casually walked into the city. With his flawless Latin, probably, Apollodorus was somehow able to talk his way into the royal quarter, and then into the palaces. I mean, he also must have been a pretty charismatic guy. Uh, I mean, we've got his background, he was able to talk his way in. Pretty impressive. I mean, this also shows that Cleopatra was willing to do what she had to do to get the job done. I mean, she didn't feel like anything was beneath her. Uh, I mean, she's done this exhausting trip up the Nile. She's stuffed herself into a bag and let herself be carried through the city. You know, clearly, um, I mean, I'm sure she had a certain level of ego, but she was not letting it interfere with, you know, doing what she had to do. And then into Caesar's private chambers. Once in Caesar's presence, Apollodorus set down the laundry bag and revealed Cleopatra. Still dressed in rags, and still a mess from the eight-day journey down the Jeez. Nile. Nevertheless, Caesar was impressed, as I think we all would be, and grew even more impressed as he heard what Cleopatra had to say. I wonder how he knew exactly it was Cleopatra. Maybe she had like a signet ring or something? Because I feel like if I just had this woman dumped at my feet dressed in rags out of a laundry bag, I'd be like, are you really Cleopatra? <laughs> this is not very believable. But I'm sure she had, I'm sure she would have thought of that. She had some way to prove her identity. We don't know exactly what happened on that first night, but we know that within a matter of time, it was clear that Caesar and Cleopatra had begun an affair. Caesar. Yeah, I think we know what happened on that first night. <laughs> Caesar decided to side with Cleopatra in the dispute with her brother, announcing that Cleopatra and Ptolemy were to serve as co-monarchs, just as their father's will instructed. Mm. Let's not get too hung up on the fact that Caesar and Cleopatra were sleeping together, though. Caesar already knew that Ptolemy's faction was behind the riots. It had mm. been nothing but thinly veiled hostility since the moment he arrived. It made a lot of sense for Rome to throw their support behind Ptolemy's rival. No yeah, I mean, look, I think a lot of made a lot is made over their relationship or supposed relationship and 
I mean, you know, I mean, I just joked about it. But at the same time, you know, I think Caesar was still thinking politically, right? He was still trying to make strategic moves. So I think Historia Civilis is right. We shouldn't make too much of that fact. It's obviously relevant, but it's not the entire thing. You know, Caesar has a lot of other motivations. No matter. And, and so does Cleopatra, for that matter. Who that was. Obviously, Ptolemy and his counselors were not happy with this new arrangement. Shortly after Cleopatra's arrival, 20,000 Egyptian soldiers descended on the city. The anti-Roman riots suddenly shifted into a formal blockade with the full support of the Egyptian military. Okay, I will say this went from, you know, a sort of tenuous situation, a risky situation, to a, a really dangerous situation for Caesar. I mean, you sort of thought he's, like I said, we've sort of left the context of the Roman Civil War a little bit. You thought, okay, maybe Caesar will get a break from the danger for a little bit. But now he's surrounded, surrounded by 20,000 troops and he's in a hostile city. And he's got 4,000 men. That is an extremely dangerous position to be in. Um, I mean, that is pretty typically Caesar. I mean, he loves getting himself in these dangerous situations where he's greatly outnumbered and in a bad position, but, I mean, this could end very badly if he's not careful. The siege of Alexandria had begun. Oh, interesting. Caesar sent- So is the- So the siege is referring to the Egyptian troops blocking Caesar in. When I saw the title, I was certain the siege of Alexandria was going to be Caesar sieging the city. Um, but I was, I was wrong. And a bunch of frantic messages to allied kings in Syria and Asia Minor. But even in the best case scenario, help was months away. Uh -oh. Within a few days, it was no longer possible to get word in or out of the city. As always, Caesar's gonna have to work it out. I mean, to be fair, being stuck in hostile territory surrounded by many of his opponents is not new to him. Uh, not being able to get supplies in or extra men in as always, Caesar's going to have to find a way out, like he always does. And Caesar's 4,000 Romans were trapped in the royal quarter. Any attempt mm. to negotiate was met with violence. Uh-oh. The king and his counselors, who were still under Caesar's care in the royal quarter, claimed that this was all happening against their orders. Okay, yeah, right. I guess that is the one advantage that Caesar has, um, because... I mean, I f at this point, I feel like his best option is trying to negotiate his way out of this. You know, he has the entire royal court under his control. That is definitely a pretty impressive bargaining chip. Which was obviously a lie. Caesar made the first move and seized the nearby Royal Harbor, which was home to both the Egyptian and the Roman oh, wow. fleets. There he was some it. intense fighting down by the docks, but in the end, the Romans were able to set fire to a bunch of ships, successfully crippling the Egyptian fleet. Many historians believe that this fire inadvertently spread into the city, consuming part of the Library of Alexandria, which oh. at this time was one of the world's greatest repositories of ancient knowledge. However, it's kind of trendy, for lack of a better word, to exaggerate the impact of this and the library would continue to operate for centuries, ultimately falling for reasons that had nothing to do with this fire. Oh, okay. Caesar had the Roman army close off the streets and fortify the royal quarter. As the defenses were going up, Arsinoe, the king's other sister, escaped Roman custody and oh. went over to the besieging Egyptian army, who not immediately good. proclaimed her queen. Yeah, not good at all. Now they have one royal with them, they can just go with her. After Arsinoe's escape, fighting began in earnest, and each day yielded only a few meters gained or lost in either direction. Okay, I mean, I thought he was going to go straight for the negotiations, but so far Caesar is, he's trying to fight it out. I will, I mean, he is incredibly outnumbered. Uh, I mean, we're talking 5 to 1, 20,000 to 4,000, but... I mean, and I really know nothing about the Egyptian military of this period, so I can't speak on that. But what I can say is that uh, the Roman legions, as I've said countless times, I mean, these are some of the best disciplined, best trained men you're going to find throughout history. Not to mention, these are Caesar's veterans. So, 
you know, they are incredibly outnumbered, but these guys are good at what they do. They are very good. Historian Philip Freeman calls this, quote, one of the most vicious campaigns of urban warfare in the ancient world. Really? Wow. This would go on for months. Caesar had never been much of a drinker, but... I mean, I guess we've seen some fighting in Rome, not too much. Um, but this is like, I mean, this is a full-on major battle right in the middle of a major city of the era, Alexandria. So I guess, you know, on second thought, that, that quote does make sense. This, this is a pretty crazy event. But during this time, he began staying up every night and drinking himself into a stupor. Yikes. These were dark times. I mean, to be fair, I can... I mean, I don't know if he's really gone that far into desperation, or if he's coping, or, or what, but you can see how that would be pretty demoralizing. You've just fought this entire civil war, you've beaten Pompey. You know, Caesar probably felt like it was finally coming to an end, and now you're locked in this potentially inescapable situation. You know, it might all be coming to an end in, you know, in Egypt of all places, um, you know, I imagine in that situation, you might start to despair a little bit. Things only got more desperate. The Egyptian army figured out how to flood the Roman water supply with impotable Ooh. seawater. This caused a minor panic, and Caesar's soldiers began to openly criticize their leader's slow response. Uh -oh. Eventually, the Romans were able to dig new wells, but morale remained low. As the fighting continued back and forth, the Egyptians started to gather a bit of momentum. The entire city rallied behind a big patriotic push to rebuild the Egyptian fleet, which involved literally ripping up buildings for their wood. Wow. These makeshift Egyptian ships eventually outnumbered the Roman fleet at something like two to one. Oh, this was bad. No. Such an extreme disadvantage at sea put the Royal Harbor at risk. Something needed to change. Yeah, this is a really desperate, this is kind of, I mean, I feel like this is a low point for Caesar. Uh, he's had many low points. This is definitely a low point, such a desperate situation, and for, for what? You know, Caesar, <laughs> he's really not getting too much out of this, even if he wins. Um, I'm sure a lot of the men there probably feel like this is an incredibly pointless battle to fight, and yet... Now the Romans are forced into fighting it. They have no choice. Now they're fighting for their lives. Caesar decided to attack the island of Pharos. Pharos was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Lighthouse of Alexandria. Mm. But more importantly, Pharos controlled access to the royal harbor. If the Romans controlled Pharos, it would buy them some time. Caesar loaded a third of his army onto- I feel like, I don't know, is he just going to make a break for it? <laughs> I feel like his best option is to try and secure the position, load his men onto boats, and try and get the fuck out of there. But we just talked about how the Egyptians rebuilt their navy, so, I mean, this is a real tricky situation. ...to a bunch of small boats and led an assault on the island. The Egyptians on Pharos were relentless in their defense of the island, and mm. as the day wore on, Egyptian reinforcements poured across the bridge. Uh -oh. By the end of the first day of fighting, the Romans had only managed to capture part of the island. On the second day, the Romans launched an all-out assault on the bridge, but by this time, they had obviously lost the element of surprise, and mm. the Roman advance ground to a halt. Then, late in the day, the Egyptian fleet swooped into the harbor and began landing soldiers behind Ooh, the Roman position. Tricky. Facing an attack on two fronts, a large number of Romans broke and fled back to their boats. Caesar saw the writing on the wall and ordered a general retreat. The boat carrying Caesar capsized. Thinking uh, quickly, Caesar slipped out of his armor and what? proceeded to... No, this is a low point. Holy shit. <laughs> I cannot believe this. Caesar... I mean, look. Caesar was not a coward. He was always there with his men leading. But, you know, this is one of the risks of that. He is 
ended up in the harbor having to slip out of his armor and I, I mean I know he makes it out of this I don't know how <laughs> to swim across the harbor all by himself Jesus. holding a bunch of maps and papers above his head to keep them dry talk about a low point I mean he's going to wash up on shore on shore drenched you know losing this battle having failed to capture this island I mean, this is the Julius Caesar, you know, one of the greatest men and greatest generals of the ancient world. Um, and like I said, he's about to roll up onto the shore like a wet dock. You know, this is not a, this is a terrible position to be in. This was one of the low points in Caesar's career. Yeah. Less than half of those who attacked the island made it back alive. Jesus. The total size of Caesar's tiny army fell by like 20%. It was a devastating defeat. The siege of Alexandria slid into its fifth month with no end in sight. Fifth month? How does he make it out? When an envoy from the besieging Egyptians approached the Romans asking for the release of their king, Caesar was all ears. The faction currently- I mean, if he can work out some sort of deal that allows him to, to get out of there alive, uh, it would absolutely be worth taking at this point. I mean, you know, we just talked, uh, you know, in the last two episodes about Caesar's great victories over Pompey. Um, he just has to get back to Roman territory, and he can pick that back up again. Currently leading the Egyptian army had shown consistent opposition to the idea of a negotiated settlement. Behind the scenes, some whispered that it might be a different story if Ptolemy were in charge. Caesar agreed to release the child king and his counselors on the condition that they come back to him with a peace plan. Okay. But Caesar was had. As soon as Ptolemy and his counselors were free, they ordered an all-out attack on- Damn, brutal. Caesar was desperate. He took probably one of the few options he felt he had, and his backfired. Um, I mean, fair enough to Ptolemy. If I was him, I'd also be like, yeah, look, the Romans are on their last legs. Keep it up. But this is pr pretty awful for Caesar. On the royal quarter. So much for that idea. About a month later, a foreign ship was able to slip past the Egyptian fleet and into the royal harbor. It carried a letter addressed to Caesar from King Mithridates of Pergamum, mm. to whom Caesar had appealed for help at the beginning of the siege. The letter said that Mithridates had just entered Egypt with 18,000 soldiers. Whoa. This was fantastic news. I mean, if this is actually happening, then Caesar is... You know, this is incredibly lucky, incredibly fortunate. Caesar used this opportunity to load the majority of his army, which was only like a couple thousand soldiers, onto his ships and sail away, leaving behind only a small garrison to hold the royal quarter. Wow. The Roman ships evaded the Egyptian fleet and sailed east around the Egyptian position. Impressive. I mean, the Romans were not knowing, were not known for their seafaring necessarily, but hey, they did a good job this time. To join up with Mithridates' army, at which point Caesar assumed command. In late March, six months after Caesar's initial landing in Egypt, a Roman-led army and an Egyptian army faced each other at what wow. historians call the Battle of the Nile. So this is, I mean, really, I've mentioned before how to be a a great man, that's the phrase we use throughout history, a great leader. Um, you need a lot of things, a lot of different skills and talents. One of the things you definitely need is luck. And, of course, Caesar sent out the cry for help, so, you know, he, you know, prodded this. But he, I think, is incredibly fortunate, incredibly lucky that someone actually came to help, and they came in time. Uh, this is definitely a situation where... Um, I don't think Caesar was saved by his own skill. Uh, he tried a couple of things in Alexandria and it failed. He was, you know, saved by his fortune, his luck, uh, as he has been several times. I mean, there's a combination. Caesar is definitely very intelligent. Uh, he is a great leader, but 
he has also benefited from a lot of luck throughout his career. The Egyptians encamped on a hill just west of a tiny little branch of the Nile with one side protected by... Of course, now he has to take the opportunity that has been granted to him by that luck uh, and, you know, use it, take advantage of it, you know, um, try and fortify and improve his position. So let's see if he can do that. By the river, another by some rocky terrain, and a third by a marsh. Wisely, the Egyptians decided to make their stand here. Mm. But naturally, before anything else could happen, the Roman-led army would have to cross the river. The Egyptians anticipated this, and sent cavalry and light infantry to make this crossing as difficult as possible. But Caesar had anticipated their anticipation, and as the Roman-led army approached the river, he sent some cavalry upstream to secretly cross ahead of the main army. Hey, this is the Caesar we love to see. He's making plans, being tricky, and, um, well, I guess we'll see if it works, but it seems like uh, this plan might work. Then, when the rest of the army reached the tiny river, they lay a bunch of tree trunks flat across its banks, forming makeshift bridges. As this was happening, the cavalry on the other side of the river came into view, and the two groups simultaneously charged. Nice. This was more than the Egyptians were expecting, and many were killed before they were able to withdraw back up the hill. The Roman-led army was already exhausted from a long day's march, but nevertheless, Caesar ordered them to storm a nearby town, hoping that the Egyptians would rush to their aid. They did not. Classic Caesar strat. <laughs> hey, go around raiding and burning towns. See if that helps. <laughs> I mean, we're out of Roman territory. He, he tried to avoid that during the Roman Civil War, because obviously it looks bad if you're burning your own towns. But now we're in hostile territory. Back to the burning and raiding towns again. <laughs> Classic strategy used in Gaul many times. Similar reasons, Caesar decided to encamp uncomfortably close to the enemy, basically at the foot of the hill. I mean, another classic Caesar strat. Uh, you know, our boy is back. He hit his low point, you know, basically hiding in Alexandria uh, and slowly being, I mean, he would have ran out of supplies or been defeated eventually. Um, but now, we, you know, we're back to classic Caesar. Again, the Egyptians remained disciplined and stayed put at the top of the hill. But the Egyptians are handling the it. The next morning, left with no other options, Caesar ordered an all-out attack. The Roman-led army charged straight up the open side of the hill. Caesar then split off a small group, instructing them to circle around and squeeze themselves between the river and the hill, where they mm. might be able to open up a second line of attack from the other direction. This didn't go very well. The uh -oh. Egyptians focused their arrow fire on this tiny, isolated group, and even brought up river vessels to fire at them from the other direction. This group Jeez. of soldiers would spend the rest of Pretty impressive response from the Egyptians, I think. I mean, we are back to more normal Caesar. I think Caesar might be a little worn out from the Civil War. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, I think he used a lot of his strategic brilliance during that. I mean, plus, you know, he's been... Uh, governing Gaul for a long time at this point. He's been fighting for many years. Yeah, he needs a bit of a break from military affairs. Um, you know, he's been doing it for a while. So, but, you know, to be fair to the Egyptians, they are also responding pretty intelligently. ...of the battle, huddled together on the side of the hill trying not to get shot and would suffer massive casualties. Meanwhile, the main group were continuing the uphill attack, but were making virtually no progress. But Caesar Yikes. noticed that in their zeal, the Egyptians had moved a little too far down the hill, oh. revealing a little gap in their line. He ordered a few Roman cohorts to circle around and see if they could exploit that gap. They got through. The cohorts stormed the top of the hill, and then turned and charged straight into the rear of the Egyptian line. This was enough to set off a widespread panic. The signal was given to retreat back to the Egyptian riverboats. It was not an orderly retreat. Uh -oh. In the confusion, the ship carrying King Ptolemy capsized, and the child king drowned in the Nile. <laughs> Jeez, well, they should have taught him how to swim. 
<laughs> Sorry, I mean, that's pretty horrible. You know, we had a, a child just drown, but obviously there's a bit of a parallel between Caesar's ship capsizing. Maybe this is why you shouldn't have children kings, um, for the sole reason that their swimming ability is not good enough. Uh, and if their ship capsizes, unlike Caesar who can swim to shore, they're going to drown. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's always bad for something like that to happen, but to be fair, this is very good for Caesar. Caesar didn't waste any time admiring his victory. He immediately left for Alexandria with a small oh. group of cavalry, bringing with him news of the Egyptian defeat and of the death of the king. The Alexandrian garrison surrendered at once which wow. at last brought the siege of Alexandria to an end. Jesus. The historian Stacy Schiff wrote in her biography of Cleopatra, quote, The best that can be said of the Alexandrian War is that Caesar acquitted himself brilliantly in a situation in which he stupidly found himself. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say this entire video... You know, this was not Caesar's finest work. He sort of got himself into a bad situation and then, you know, failed to get himself out for months until, uh, you know, he basically got saved by one of his allies. That That is what happened. And there's still flashes of that usual Caesar brilliance, but this was definitely not one of his best uh, expeditions. Plutarch, an ancient writer that I would generally categorize as pro-Caesar, wrote, quote, As for the war in Egypt, some say that it was not necessary, later describing it as, quote, inglorious mm. and full of peril. Yeah, okay, so I'm not the only one thinking that. Even generally pro-Caesar figures are saying, yeah, so there wasn't much of a point to this. And I, I, I think I made that argument earlier in this episode where I said if you're one of the soldiers— you know, trapped in this siege, uh, one of Caesar's soldiers, you're probably thinking, why are we even here? You know, now we're trapped in this fight for our lives. We, we're not, you know, you probably would have thought we're not even going to make it out. You know, this is terrible. And what is our reason for being here? This is not worth it. Um, and I think that was definitely the case. I mean, there was, you know, an incredible amount of risk. Caesar honestly almost didn't make it out at several points. Um, and, he, I don't think he really got too much from this. I mean, especially considering he had just beaten Pompey and not won. The, the Civil War's not over, but had basically won that part of the Civil War. Um, you know, it really wasn't worth it to, to have this situation arise. There's a pretty broad historical consensus that this entire campaign was a disaster. And frankly, yeah. it's astonishing that it wasn't the end of Caesar's career. Yeah, for real. But now there were a lot of points during that siege when, you know, you would have thought Caesar was not going to make it out. Um, uh, I mean, when his boat got capsized, um, when the Egyptians rebuilt their fleet, uh, when Caesar tried to slip past them. I mean, just a, an incredible level of risk. And he somehow made it out. Um, like I said, this is a case, you know, Caesar has both brilliance and luck on his side. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to work out which was more important. Sometimes uh, one was more important than the other. Often there's a mix. I think in this case, it was definitely more luck than brilliance. Now that Cleopatra was fully empowered in Egypt, a peace deal was possible. Cleopatra agreed to repay Egypt's debts in full and wow. to host a permanent Roman garrison. She also agreed to serve as co-monarch with her last living brother, also named Ptolemy, <laughs> and to let the Romans take her sister Arsinoe back to Rome in chains. Mm. In exchange, Caesar agreed to return the province of Cyprus to Egypt. Oh, wow. Romans giving territory up, something that almost never happened. That's quite a, con that's quite a concession from Caesar. After the Battle of the Nile and the subsequent peace settlement, Caesar lingered in Egypt for three months. What was he doing? Not a whole lot. Caesar and Cleopatra used this time to travel up the Nile with the Roman army. 
On paper, this was a demonstration to the people of Egypt that their new queen had Rome's full support. But mm -hmm. if we're being honest, it was probably just an excuse to take a pleasure cruise. Yeah. I mean, I'm of two minds about this. Uh, on one hand, <laughs> you know, Caesar definitely needs a break. You know, I just mentioned that. Uh, he needs a break. He deserves a break. On the other hand, can you afford to be wasted this time, man? You gotta get back to Rome. <laughs> you know, you need to secure your territory. Um, you know, stamp out the final Pompeian resistance. Uh, and start governing Rome again. So, <laughs> I, I get it. Uh, and I mean, obviously, he wants to spend time with Cleopatra, right? That's it. And I, so I get it. And he does deserve a bit of a break. But, you know, it's not really the smartest thing to do at this moment, I don't think. By the time everybody returned to Alexandria, Cleopatra was extremely pregnant. Oh. She would later give birth to a boy, naming it, wait for it, Ptolemy. Back in Rome, people would half-jokingly refer to the child as Caesarian, which mm. means Little Caesar. It's not exactly a subtle nickname, but it's the name that historians still use. Wow. By this time... I mean, Caesar's taking a cruise down the Nile with his lover, while, I mean, look at all that orange territory. I mean, it's not a ton, but, you know, you think you'd want to sort of get rid of that, you know, deal with that news from the wider world was beginning to trickle into Egypt. Most of it was not good. <laughs> First, of course. an allied king in Asia had turned against Rome and was slaughtering every Roman citizen found in his territory. Yikes. Second, the remnants of the Pompeian faction were gathering strength at an alarming rate down in North Africa. Mm. Third, Mark Antony was making a big old mess of Roman politics back home, and of course things he was. were approaching a boiling point. Clearly, Caesar still lacked a reliable second in command. Every time. Oh, Labinus, we remember him fondly. Unfortunately, he just uh, he couldn't come with us, you know, he could not stick with Caesar, and so he got replaced with Mark Antony. Um, and honestly, if you're looking at Mark Antony and some of his failings, you would think, uh, there's no way he's going to stay relevant. Uh, but he will. He will be relevant for a long time coming. Um, but he doesn't always do the best job of things. He removed himself from the equation. Things began to crumble. Lingering in Egypt had probably been a mistake. Yeah. Alrighty. This was an interesting one. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was very, uh, it was a crazy one, you know. At many times throughout this video, I did not know how Caesar was going to make it. It was also an interesting one because, I mean, it showed us some of Caesar's lowest points. It also showed us Caesar, like, not really performing at his best, uh, at really at no point throughout this video. Um, I mean, the whole siege itself, Caesar shouldn't have got himself into that mess, and, you know, he failed to get himself out. Um, you know, the end battle against the Egyptians, uh, he won it, of course, but it wasn't one of his most brilliant victories, of course. Uh, and then he wasted a bunch of time <laughs> sailing down the Nile with Cleopatra. Just, you know, not the best we've seen out of Caesar at all. In fact, some of the worst we've seen out of Caesar. Um, but, you know, hopefully he's taken a bit of a break. He's escaped a near-death situation. Maybe he's a little bit more refreshed uh, and ready to get back to Rome and start, you know, start running things again. So I'm curious to see where Caesar goes from here. Uh, yeah, so I enjoyed this one. If you guys did, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.